Hello, this is Drew Collins, Rector of St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Savannah, Georgia. Today is the 14th Sunday after Trinity. It is September the 10th, and I would like to invite you to join me in praying the collect appointed for today. Almighty and everlasting God, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love that which thou dost command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here beginneth the ninth verse of the thirteenth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the Gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be on and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, as I have told you think all things beforehand. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Well, Earlier this week, a cartoon went out. It was, I believe, from the old Family Circus uh, strip that used to run in in newspapers all across the country. It was a favorite of my parents. They, I think some of the things that happened with the children, they re resonated with them. Perhaps certain things that would be projected on uh, what the, the, the certain things that the children said in the cartoon would be would remind them of things that my brother and I had said. But uh, in this particular one, the uh, little boy was looking up at the, the minister and he said, you know, you ought to give a, a cliffhanger a, a, to encourage people to come the following week. And uh, I that resonated with me a bit because as I said last week, the we're going to, Last week and this week and then next week we are covering the Olivet Discourse and uh, in a sense that's what we've done. You, you may remember those kind of hooks to, to draw you in, the cliffhangers that held you over until uh, the following week. If you were alive in 1980 as I was, if you have memories of 1980, you remember probably three things over the summer of 1980. You remember wondering uh, how the election was going to go that year, the presidential election, who the nominees would be, because it was a race. Both candidates, uh, both the incumbent, Jimmy Carter, uh, faced primary opposition, as, and of course the Republican primary was up for grabs. Uh, you remembered wondering when the hostages would be freed and how that would pan out. And finally, you remembered wondering who shot J.R., and there were bumper stickers that said, I shot J.R., who shot J.R., there were t-shirts, and all kinds of theories as to who shot J.R., but that was a hook, and in the fall, when they revealed who shot J.R., it was one of the highest rated television programs of all history, 
Well, in a sense, that resonated with me because I was like, I gave a hook last week and I'm going to give a bit of a hook this week. Uh, because of the way that the, the, the Olivet Discourse breaks down. As I mentioned, I think that a good bit of this passage has already been fulfilled. I'm not teaching prophecy or that which I think is to come. I'm not trying to get into any of that. Next week, we'll cover the end of the A, the end of the world. And in that case, uh, that the end of all time and the end of all history, that has not come yet. So I guess there's your hook to, uh, to tune in next week or to, uh, to come. Better yet, if you're in Savannah, come to church. Don't uh, Watching this way is good. In person is always better. But Jesus is talking to, to his disciples, and he said, Be on your guard. They will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. He's warning his disciples that they will face persecution. They are going to be called before the civil magistrate, before governors, and before religious leaders, and they're, gonna, they're going to be asked to bear testimony, and they're going to be beaten. And in some cases, he doesn't say so here, but in many cases in history, they would lose their lives. Now, we read this today, and we think that's rather uh, remote, but that being said... Um, there are places in the world today where people face persecution. Uh, when I took the first of my doctor of ministry classes uh, up at uh, Erskine Seminary, one of the fellow students in my class was a fellow named Zishan, who is in pa Pakistan. And in Pakistan, there has been some persecution and some unrest uh, for the Christians there from the Muslims and the Hindus in that country. And I sent a note to, to Zishan uh, late, late last night at, wanting to make sure he's okay. And I, I trust that he is. But it's important for us to remember here in the United States, we don't face much opposition or have not yet up until this point. Uh, I go out in public fairly regularly wearing a clerical collar, something that, that marks me as a Christian. And I am, if anything, it's, uh, I may be less likely to get beaten because of it, not more. But I don't fear persecution by, so identi by identifying as a Christian. And as I said to my people who came here and saw this live earlier today, you probably faced no, no danger or danger of being attacked on your way to church here today because you were coming to church. Now, you may have faced traffic that raised your blood pressure, but you didn't face persecution. You didn't face uh, attack. There are places in the world where if you're going to church, you don't let people know that you're going to church because it can result in your life ending. Now, I suspect here in this country we're going to experience, uh, well, we're already seeing where the church does not enjoy as privileged a place as it once had. I think particularly of cases where uh, it's sad to say, but even even marriages of Christians split up. And perhaps where a Christian parent who holds to traditional definitions of sexuality and, and, and conduct, and then if there's one parent who doesn't, the Christian parent may be penalized. And there have been cases where they were penalized because they were viewed as religious fanatics. Well, the bar for being viewed as a religious fanatic in parts of the country uh, that are increasingly secularized is lower and lower and lower. If you come to church and, and you read your Bible and you pray regularly and you seek to apply it to life, then in some places you will be a religious fanatic. Now, here in the South, we're blessed. It hasn't happened quite as fast, but trust me, it is coming. Jesus promised persecution, so we should not be dismayed when these things happen. We should be prepared to, to stand firm in the faith, to, as uh, Dean Frederick Farrar advised in, in looking at the Olivet Discourse, the four messages that he said that it sends, the former Dean of uh, Canterbury, beware, watch, endure, and pray. 
And then Jesus says, so there will come time when we're brought before these tribunals, and at times our purpose there will, will just be to bear witness. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now, some would look at this and say, well, that, that had not happened in, in 70 A.D., but in fact it had in the sense of nations there. First of all, there's some figurative language here. It's not necessarily saying every single political division in the world, but you also need to understand nations. The Greek word there is ethnos. And indeed, the gospel spread remarkably fast through 12 disciples who were not who any management training firm would, uh, would select uh, to start a new enterprise. There's that somewhat satirical email that goes around written to Jesus from a management training firm. They're looking at all of the all of the all of the apostles, and and they they list problems with all of them. But they say there's one who shows tremendous pro, uh, uh, ability and is indeed is good with money. His name's Judas Iscariot. Promote immediately. Well, the gospel from those twelve people did spread, and by God's grace, and in the power of God, were was proclaimed to all of the ethnos, to all of the nations to all of the ethnic uh, uh, subdivisions and the national uh, uh, the, the the nations as understood there the gospel had it spread throughout the known world and by AD 70 uh, that had happened and it is still happening today that the task is not over by the way and when they bring you to trial to deliver you do not be uh, deliver you over do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say what is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who, sp who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, I've heard some people misinterpret this, and J.C. Ryle in his commentary on this passage is quick to note this doesn't mean that you should not prepare for sermons. Now, some people actually interpret that this way. They'll say, don't prepare for sermons. Just get up and let the Holy Spirit uh, say through you whatever he's going to say. Well, I I think that Scripture is clear that we should study to show ourselves approved, and uh, as the old saying goes, we are called to preach the foolishness of the cross. However, there's a difference between that, the foolishness of preaching, and preaching foolishness. And if someone gets up and has no preparation and totally wings it on a routine basis, I fear that they may preach foolishness. However, when we are called before tribunals, when we are put in those spots, God, through the Holy Spirit, will enable us, will give us uh, the words to say. I remember several years ago, <clears throat> I was minding my own business on a Tuesday afternoon, and I got a message from a, a minister whom I know, I'm not even that close with, to be honest with you, but he was. we disagree on a number of things. But he asked me if I was uh, free that night. And I said, in looking at my calendar, I actually had the dates aligned wrong. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm sorry, but I asked the natural question, why? He said, well, the Alliance for Full Acceptance, which was up in Charleston, the LGBTQ plus uh, advocacy group was going to have a panel discussion on religious liberty and LGBTQ rights. And the, uh, the minister, the more traditional minister, who was going to be a part of that panel uh, had had to beg out, had a family emergency, and so they needed a more traditional uh, minister, someone who held to, uh, as the Reformed Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in North America do, and as I, as an individual do, traditional uh, sexual ethic, they needed somebody to, to represent that. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I I'm, have a commitment. And then I realized that I didn't have a commitment that night, and I uh, happened to send a, a, an instant message to my friend Matt Kennedy, uh, who is a, an Anglican priest in Binghamton, New York, and Basically, the tone and tenor of it was, whew, I dodged a bullet there. And Matt told me, and I had occasion 
when he and his family were in town recently to remind him of this in person. But Matt said, I think you ought to go. And I said, but Matt, I've, 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 I've not studied up. I mean, I literally have about five hours to prepare for this. Uh, to to go and and I I have no time to prepare and he said look you've been you've been studying these issues for years I think you ought to go and so I uh, hemmed and hawed for a bit and started but I started feeling convicted in junk I hate it when that happens and so it turned out that I said yes I can make it and I went and. Uh, prayed. I sent out an e email to a number of people and I said, please pray for me. I don't want to be uh, Archie Bunker in a clerical collar. I also don't want to be uh, have, a, have a spine of tapioca. I want to speak the truth and speak the truth in love to a group that is admittedly going to be somewhat hostile. And I went and uh, it was the panel consisted of myself, a Unitarian, uh, not Unitarian Universalist, a uh, United Church of Christ minister who was very progressive, and an ACLU lawyer. And I went, and I don't know that I convinced anyone, but I did bear witness. And, and, and I really wasn't sure what effect it had had, but some weeks later I mentioned it to Mark Lawrence, who was the uh, bishop of the, uh, what is now known as the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, I mentioned it to him, and he said, your job, because I said, I don't know if I convinced anyone, and I don't think I convinced many people. And he said, your job was not to convince anyone. Your job was to bear witness. And I said, well, by God's grace, I did that. So yes, the Holy Spirit will tell us what to say when we are called before these tribunals or when we are put on the spot like that. However, we may not convince anyone, but we are called to bear witness. But that doesn't justify lack of preparation uh, for sermons. And I actually know people, by the way, I, I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I know people who have used this as a verse to advocate no sermon preparation. Uh, and that's not a practice I would recommend. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father the father his child, and children will rise against parents and put them to death. Horrible division, but yet division that we see in the church at times. I've told the, I've mentioned before, a friend of mine who was a missionary in Pakistan had uh, had baptized this man. He had he'd been instrumental in the man embracing the Christian faith, and he baptized him, and his father had put out a hit on him. He had talked to an assassin and was had, had left instructions and hired somebody to shoot him when he got off of the bus, as he did every day. And that day, on the day that it was appointed that he was to be shot, his father was sitting waiting at home, no doubt with mixed emotions about what he knew was going to happen, and about 15 minutes after it was to happen, who walks in the door but his son. He says, hey, Dad, I'm home. In the providence of God, the shooter did not see him, did not recognize him. But there are cases today where to accept Christ, to believe on Christ, to confess Christ, particularly to be baptized because that is our sacramental entrance into the kingdom of God, particularly when that happens, is to call down the wrath of even your family upon you. Jesus says, and the one who, for you will be hated for all by my, for my name's sake, but the one who endear, endures to the end will be saved. We're called, again, to beware, to watch, to endure, and to pray in all things. And then Jesus says, when, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, the concept of the abomination of desolation was something that was very familiar to the people who were hearing this from Jesus. In the book of Daniel, Daniel, Daniel relates, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, 
The man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening and sac- of the time of the evening sacrifice. <clears throat> he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, "O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding." At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you it is you, it, it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, bring in, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anoint, an anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. Then for 72 weeks it will be built again with squares and a moat in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and its sanctuary. So, this was to come. The, he, they foresaw it here, but, but more vividly, these Jews would have been familiar with the events that were recorded in First and Second Maccabees. Now, I hardly ever refer to the Deut- Deuterocanonical books in preaching, but the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical books, Anglicans read them for instruction in life and manners. We do not receive them as canonical scripture. But everyone, even our even our Presbyterian and Baptist friends, everyone recognizes that these are good history, particularly the, the books of Maccabees. And, and that's how we get a lot of our information about the intertestamental period, that period between uh, Malachi and Matthew. And so we read there that in the, on the 15th day of Chislev, In the 145th year, they elected a sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offering. They also built altars in the surrounding cities of Judah and burned incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. The books of the law that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Where the book of the covenant was found in possession of anyone or if anyone adhered to the law, the decree of the king condemned him to death. So there was set up on the altar of God a sacrilege. This is before the temple, uh, under uh, the Maccabean revolt. This is the abomination of desolation. Likewise, in Second Maccabees chapter six, we read not long after this, the king sent an Athenian senator to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their fathers and to cease to live by the laws of God, and to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and call it the temple of Olympian Zeus, and to call the one in Gerizim the temple of Zeus, the friend of strangers, as did the people who dwelt in that place. That was the abomination of desolation with which they were familiar, and and Jesus says that this will also happen in the days of Rome. When you see this standing, it's to be assigned to them, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down, nor enter the house or take anything out. Now, houses in those days would have stairways that you could get down off of the roof, almost like fire escapes. He's saying, go down there. Don't worry about what's in the house. Get out. And let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. He is speaking here of the destruction of Jerusalem where God used the Roman forces, a pagan army, to accomplish his work. Jerusalem had abandoned Christ and had abandoned the law and the temple was no longer needed because Jesus was the the sacrifice once and for all for propitiation of our sins. And so the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, 
he shortened the days. Even in the midst of this judgment, God was merciful toward and for his people. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, as I mentioned, is it's heavy stuff. It's, this is not light preaching. But it is in the Gospel of Mark for a reason. It is here so that we may be instructed and so that we may know and that Jesus' disciples may, may have known the things that were to come. Now, as I mentioned, the last Sunday and this Sunday I, is my firm belief, and not all preachers and Bible scholars would agree with me, but throughout the church, much of this has been seen as having been fulfilled in 70 A.D. Not all of it. So next Sunday... Here's the hook for the, for the cliffhanger. Next Sunday, we'll discuss what is to come at the end of our age. This is the, this is the, coming, this is the end of the age, the age in which Jesus was living, the epoch. But there will come a time when all time, all of history is drawn to a close. And that is dealt with in the Olivet Discourse. So I hope that you will be able to hear that next week as we consider that. But most of all, I hope that we are ready, that we can take comfort when we are persecuted, that we can beware, that we can watch, we can pray, and we can endure, but also that when we are called to face persecution and tribulation, we can know this, that Jesus has the victory. Jesus secured the victory at the cross, and even in the midst of this, even at time when in, in places and times where it seems that there is no hope and that no good can come out of it, by God's grace and to his glory, even there God is at work. May we stand firm and endure. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.